Okay, shall we start uh, the second lecture of this uh, morning? I have the pleasure to introduce Professor Dan Kojok from National Research Council of Italy. He will present us a talk about optical tweezers, basics and application. So please, Professor. Okay, so can you hear me? Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, I led the picture during the break, so probably you identify the, uh, identify the places. We are here, CTP, Trieste, downtown, and uh, the electrosynchrotron and the free electron laser, and uh, our lab, our institute, and uh, my lab basically is here the lab uh, optical manipulation. So uh, as you know, in uh, Trieste, beside ICTP, there is a university, there is this uh, um, scientific pole, uh, Ara Science Park, and uh, there there is an electrosynchrotron, and there is a free electron laser, and around it there are uh, parts of uh, some institutes belonging to the National um, Research Council of Italy. And uh, besides this, there is also the International School of, uh, of Advanced Studies, CISA. Um, so it is quite uh, a high density of uh, scientific uh, activity here in Trieste. Okay, the outline of my talk is as follows. I will start with um, describing how the optical tweezers works and then uh, what uh, we can manipulate with optical tweezers. Then we will speak about uh, measuring pico-newton's forces with optical tweezers, about direct and indirect methods, and then some applications of optical tweezers for uh, living cell studies probing forces, probing the stiffness of the cells, mechanotransduction, that is converting the mechanical signals that it is induced by optical tweezers into a chem biochemical signal to the cell, and then biochemical local cell stimulation using optically, optically manipulated vectors, which bring active molecules close to the cell and induce a signal to the cell. So we start with uh, radiation pressure of light. So we all know that uh, a photon has energy and uh, carries momentum. And uh, that momentum can be transferred to an object by interaction, by, for instance, by reflection, as you will see in a moment. Then if we consider uh, a light wave being carrying uh, a momentum flux, the radiation pressure is the momentum transferred per second per unit area, or in other words, energy deposited per second per unit area divided by uh, velocity of light. So the point is that this radiation pressure exists. What is the effect? The effect in terms of forces is uh, difficult in general to be detected because these forces are very small. But with uh, the use of laser light, uh, which is able to generate high optical in intensities and high optical intensity gradients, we can observe the effect of these forces. So just to point out that uh, Kepler probably was the first to observe the radiation pressure effect on the comets, on the tail of the comets, observing that they are oriented, they always point away from the sun. So saying that the particles in the tail of the comet are oriented because of the sun radiation pressure. The radiation pressure of the sunlight on the Earth is in average at the level of micropascal, so it is very small. Fortunately and unfortunately, you can think in both terms. Another example, more recent example, is a Doppler cooling damping of atomic motion in 
what is called optical molasses. So if you use a laser, two laser beams counter-propagating this, and uh, laser beams are tuned slightly below the resonance, you will have the atoms in between which absorb more photons if they move towards the light source due to the Doppler effect. No? And then they absorb photon and they emit photon, but the photons are emitted randomly. And this means that the momentum which is transferred by emission, it is less in the direction of the movement of the atom, and you will have a negative force which slows down the movement of the atom. So if uh, you combine three in three directions, this you create an optical molasses where you create a high density of atoms which are slowed down. So first observation of this phenomena was uh, done by Hensch and Shallow in 75. Ah, the year is missing, so it's 1975. Now let us discuss uh, ray optics approximation of the effect of the ray of light on particles. And let us see how big is the force exerted by a ray of light on a micro bead. And we consider that the size of the bead is two micron, that is, is uh, bigger than uh, uh, the wavelengths. We consider that the bead is uh, reflecting perfectly, so the reflection coefficient is one. And um, following with uh, uh, some simple calculations, we get that the force is uh, of about, on the bead, is of about 2.7 by 10 to minus 27 Newton if we consider one photon. But if we consider 10 to 15 photons, which means a wave is a power of uh, 0.4 milliwatt, so a low power laser beam, we get 2.7 piconewton, which is a small force, of course, but what it is important, it is which is the effect of this force. Okay. So if this bead is in free space, then the acceleration, it is 34 J gravitational acceleration, so which is very big. Because the bead is small, the mass is small, so the acceleration is big, even for a small force. If the bead is in water, then we have a fast damping. No? So we have the damping because of the water. And we have a terminal, so the bead is accelerated, but very soon stops. It reaches if we stop the laser beam, I mean. If we keep it constant, we get a terminal velocity, 360 micrometers per second, which for micro world, it is big velocity. And we have the time constant, which is 0.8 microseconds, which is small. Okay. It is to be noticed in this case that for a small size particle, damping is dominant over inertia because the mass goes with the size to the third, while the drag uh, coefficient goes with the size. Okay. And uh, an example for, uh, from biology, I think here, not I think, I do not, we do not see the lower part of, uh, so the second row there, but in any case, so the movement of a bacterium in water, uh, so to have the bacterium moving in water with a normal velocity of some microns per second, the motor should develop a force of about 0.51 piconewton. So what I want to put in connection is the range of the forces that can be induced on microparticles by light 
and then the range of forces specific to biology. In fact, there is a very, oh, I cannot escape of this because all, all the references are that row. I don't understand why we do not see it, but it doesn't matter. So this is from a book of Howard, Howard on uh, cell mechanics. So you will find them anyway in the PDFs that I download on, uh, on the site, okay? Just to illustrate different type of forces and their magnitudes at the single molecule level. And we have elastic, covalent, viscous, uh, collisional, thermal, gravity, centrifugal, electrostatic, and van der Waals. The point is that they go in quite a wide range, but anyway, any, anywhere here you see pico-newton. And pico-newton, by the way, is also the weight of a single red blood cell. Okay? So this is a good reason, or if one asks why optical tweezers in biology, the answer is around, also around this thing. So now, let us make a step forward. And uh, beside reflection, we consider another bit which is perfectly transparent. So reflection is zero. We have only refraction. So we have the bending of the ray. And by conservation of momentum, we have the force transmitted to the bit. In this case, the magnitude of the force is lower than twice the um, so the coefficient, this for reflection is two. In this case, it is lower than two. It's clear now from this vectorial decomposition. Then it comes out that the total force on a particle interacting with an incident light beam by reflection, scattering, but also refraction, absorption, emission is given by the difference between the momentum flux in entering the object and the one leaving it. If you remember, this is a slide from Professor Marcano lecture, where he was speaking about sample interacting with light and the effects induced and about energy conservation. In this case, we consider also momentum conservation, but the picture is the same, the approach. No? We have incident, transmitted light, we have interaction here, and if we measure the differences between what it enters and what it exits, we can get the force. So this is in principle. And now we will see if, in which terms and when this is possible to do. So, um, here, I want to introduce, there are many, many references on uh, optical tweezers, optical manipulation, but I think that kind of Bible is uh, this book by Arthur Ashkin, published in Scientific Publishing 2006. Uh, you can see the cover, and the cover is even very nice experiment describing. It is describing the levitation of a microparticle. In this case, is a hollow microparticle to have the weight to be less. And the weight of the microparticle is compensated by the laser beam. So this is the photo, and this is the scattering from the microparticle. No? And this is a mere pattern that you can observe after so the scattering from the particle, forward scattering. And I think it is very nice physics here. So actually, you need only pico-newton forces to balance the weight of the particle. The problem to make this experiment is here, how you detach the particle, which initially sits on a surface. And there you have van der Waals forces. So you have small forces, but much bigger than what you can develop with radiation pressure. So instead of pico-newton, you have nano-newton. And then he put a shaker, 
a piezo shaker to detach the particles, and then they are brought to the equilibrium. We did this experiment also in the lab. I think this is a, an example of an experiment that can be done with very low cost. And it is very nice, I think, as physics, because you have here acoustics, you have uh, optics, you have a uh, lot of, of stuff for, for, for students. But the book is, is very, very, very nice. The advantage of a book is this. Uh, you, from a paper, you get information and what one succeeded to do. From a book, you get the information also about the failures and what one learned from the failures, from when the experiment didn't work, which is, in my opinion, very important. Now, again, uh, I come back to the ray optics, just to illustrate the origin of the scattering force for a plane wave we have only scattering force, or so we have only a component which pushes the beam forward. But if we use a Gaussian beam, a laser beam is Gaussian beam, beam zero, zero, and we have the particle out of the axis, we see that there is a force called transverse gradient force, it has a, this component, which brings the particle towards the axis. If the particle is low index, for instance, bubbles, air inside, uh, lipid shell, and outside water, means low index particles, the particles are repealed out of the beam. So this is a case for a mildly focused Gaussian wave beam, which means that you focus a beam through a low numerical aperture lens. And that's it. Ashkin in 70 published this seminal paper showing what he observed. He observed that focusing the beam with low numerical aperture into a sample where you have particles in liquid, you get the particles confined along the laser beam and pushed against this wall. And this is called 2D trap. If you put another laser counter-propagating, you get a 3D beam, 3D trap, sorry. This paper is very important because it introduces a concept, but theoretically, Ashkin also hypothesized that, that similar acceleration and trapping are possible with atoms and molecules using light tuned to specific transitions. Then, this is 70, then it was 75, now the Doppler effect, so it's a technical stuff, then you will see. So then, we skip for a moment to 86, when Ashkin and uh, Steve Chu and the colleagues, they introduced the single beam 3D trapping. So the single gradient force optical trap. So using a high numerical aperture objective and one single beam. You can see here um, so the forces and uh, why the bead is brought to the focus of the beam, okay? And I, in red, I figured out also the component of the force which arises from a low numerical ray. So from a ray which comes close to the op optical axis, the component of the force is oriented like this, which means that this will push the bead. So we will find an equilibrium. Besides this, we have also reflections, of course, not only refraction, which are not considered here. The setup was very nice, with lateral observing beside this axial, so this is the axis of the microscope, let us say, which allowed also to see the fluorescence. You see here in fluorescence, you see the scattering of the, the fluorescence in water. So it's beautiful paper and 
very important because they basically screened trapping particles from MIE to Rayleigh regime. So in a huge range from 10 micron to 25 nanometer experimentally. Actually, the work around this was about atom trapping. You will see in a moment. So we, we were speaking about small particles, small particles in the rain, Rayleigh range. So for this, you cannot apply the ray optics, of course. You can apply the dipole approximation. And you still have the same type of forces at the end in the as effect, gradient and scattering. Because the idea is this, to try to treat for all the range of particles as size, as um, material, the effect of radiation pressure in terms of scattering and gradient forces. So for gradient forces, we have a dependence on the size to the three. For scattering, from the uh, Rayleigh scattering, we have radio, uh, size to the six. It is also nice you now that uh, they give the conditions for axial stability and transverse stability from which you see that theoretically you can trap 14 nanometer particles, and they trapped experimentally 25, which is not bad. It is a long story about this paper. Uh, Ashkin was working at uh, Bell uh, Labs, and um, usually the paper had to be sent for an internal review before being sent to the journal. And uh, the internal review was very bad was in four points. The first point was there is no new physics here. The second point was, um, but it is not even wrong. So I could not find nothing wrong here, which is Pauli uh, sarcastic uh, saying, no, if you do something or you do well or you do it wrong, if you do not it even wrong, it is bad, bad. So, and the, four, the third was, um, it might be published somewhere, the fourth, but not in physics review later. So at the end, this paper was sent because uh, they discussed, and it is one of the most cited 20 papers of, in the history of physics review letters. So it's, uh, I, I might go run out of the time, but I tell you also this. What we learn from this? If you are a reviewer, take care, read well what you receive. If you are an author and you are convinced about what you did, do not give up. Okay? Good. So in terms of uh, ray optics, because we spoke about Rayleigh regime, now MIR regime, where we apply ray optics, Ashkin also now developed the expression for the force, scattering, gradient, in terms of Fresnel coefficient uh, reflection, transmission. And at the end, it comes out of the simple formula, now F is Q and one power divided by C, where Q is a dimensionless uh, coefficient depending on the shape, depending on the geometry. You know? And this is uh, in uh, 92. From this, he theoretically also derived how, which is the force exerted on a bead, on a particle, when the particle is not in the center. So it is moved axially or axially or laterally. And here you have the axial, so you see that at equilibrium you have zero. So Q stands for Z coefficient, Q total. So you see that at the, if the bead moves by its radius, then the Q increases very much. And you have also some force outside, because otherwise how you explain that the particles come into the trap, 
is not that you switch on the laser and you have the particles there. You will see in the afternoon. The same is valid for transverse sources. So now let us go a bit back. I said you a story 70s, something 75. So why the way to single beam, which was 86, was so long? Not because they hadn't ideas and were not able to do, but because actually, or mainly, Ashkin's dream was to trap atoms, and uh, not only his dream. So there was one contribution of him, very important, theoretical, on trapping of atoms by resonance radiation pressure, where he put the basis, basically, for what they did in 86 experimentally. So in 86 was the first experimental observation of optically trapped atoms using a single beam gradient beam and cooling the atoms with a Doppler effect. And this was the basis for two Nobel Prizes. So one was 97, Stephen Chu, Claude Cohen, Tanuji, and William Phillips for development of methods to cool and trap atoms with laser light. In 2001, Cornell, Kettle, Wiman for the achievement of Bose-Einstein condensation in dilute gases of alkali atoms and for early fundamental studies of the properties of the condensates. Well, Ashkin, meanwhile, focused on using optical tweezers to trap and study various living things, including tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus, uh, various bacteria, red blood cells, and uh, uh, without damaging them. I do not bother you anymore with Ashkin. Uh, this is the last slide, uh, a photo of him from the lab. And uh, his technician, Ziyajic, and uh, him in the lab. And you might notice that uh, his technician is in a lot of his papers as author, which is not very common in our days. So if you want to more information, you find here. So in one slide, properties of optical tweezers. So what particles we can trap as material dielectric, metallic. So I didn't spoke about metallic scattering and gradient force because there we have the polarizability is not real, it is uh, complex. And we have also so a term which is absorption and counts in trapping. And basically what, you, what is the consequence is that you cannot trap in 3D or very difficult. There are some, some works, one is mentioned here. Biological, cells, macromolecules, intracellular structures, DNA filaments, low index, so for instance, ultrasound agent contrast, they are uh, lipid uh, shell bubbles with uh, gas inside, and they are very much used when you uh, are doing echography to increase the contrast of, um, of in echography. So they have a, a medical interest. Crystal or amorphous material, size from 20 nanometers to 20 micrometers, shapes, spherical, cylindrically arbitrary. So basically, I would say everything. Um, types of laser beams, Gaussian, Laguerre Gaussian. So Laguerre Gaussian, they are important besides their donut-like intensity profile. They are important also because they carry angular momentum, which can be transferred to the particles. Also, Bessel beams are interesting because uh, you can trap particles in a bottle. So Bessel beam, they reconfigure themselves after the obstacle. Mm -hmm. So this is why you can trap bottles of, of particles. Here I mentioned some reviews, which I considered important. Ah, and uh, the group of uh, others had in Denmark is uh, known for nanoparticles. Uh, uh, trapping. Now some examples, funny, I hope. Here what you will see, you see a bead, and here you might see the donut intensity profile of an LG beam, 
And uh, no, this is not a bid. This is a bubble, sorry. And this is a bid stack. So you see that the bid pushes the bubble, but the bubble does not exit the ring because it's kept there by the intensity. And now it exits. So it's kind of micro billiard. No? Um, the configuration here is, um, is this. The bubble, beer, champagne, buoyancy goes here no? by itself. Here we confine it, and the stack bit is here. And then we move to understand the experiment. Um, another, uh, but here is not over orbital angular momentum transfer. It's just the donut beam used. Here is a very simple rotor. So it's a Gaussian beam and a small piece of glass which is trapped it is trapped like this along the optical axis, and then due to the asymmetry, is rotating. So it's a motor. But then how we stop it? Using a donut beam, and how it stopped. Because you put the ring of light on it, and so on and so far. Uh, and finally, this is an example of uh, using a Gaussian and a Laguerre Gaussian, because Laguerre Gaussian is produced with a diffractive optical element, and in all the cases, you have uh, the zero order, which is a Gaussian beam. So what you see in the center here is due to Gaussian beam. What you see here is due to LG beam, which transfers the orbital angular momentum to the particles, and at the moment, we change the direction of rotation, simply making negative the diffractive optical element. Uh, we had projects, nice projects with this, uh, mainly with bubbles, because it was this a problem to study a bubble, not here, but here, so far from surface, excited by ultrasounds, so we had to keep it here. So we used a donut beam and the buoyancy was balanced by the zero order. And then we excited with ultrasounds and we studied the vibration of the bubble. And then two bubbles and bubble close to tissues because this uh, has implications in, uh, in medicine for drug delivery, local drug delivery. You know? If you can identify where the bubble is, and uh, you, it brings also some drugs, and you can make, implode it, so you deliver locally. So about optical trapping, I am looking, okay. Optical trapping and manipulation of bio, bioparticles, living cells. So the issues are this. Do we damage, because there is a huge intensity of light there, and if we damage, which is the level of damage? This is an important question, in my opinion, because usually, uh, in, since I moved toward biology, I learned this. Because before, the question was, do you damage it? No, I don't kill it, so I don't damage it. Yeah, but if I lose one arm, I do not die, but I, I do not feel well, I think. So the idea is, if you damage, to be, take care that you do not damage that function that you are going to study to be sure about that, because otherwise it's not good. So then the shape of, of particles in biology, they are very different. They are not symmetric. Uh, can we trap? I answer you first to this, to two, yes. I mean, uh, because you trap for a cell, you trap through the nucleus. It is enough on uh, uh, intracellular particle and uh, so on. So again, I said that no, nothing about Ashkin, but uh, I'm sorry. Um, he was the first trying to trap uh, tobacco mosaic vi virus, and it was a science publication in 87, and it was very nice because um, it was demonstrated that using even a green laser, the particles were not damaged, this. And then the particles are very small, 
transversally. So it's difficult to see them as image of the microscope, but he used Rayleigh scattering, lateral scattering, and counted how many particles when a new particle came into the trap. Nice. So what type of laser is good to use? The type of laser uh, depends on the absorption in water because most of the material in a biological cell is water. And proteins and other molecules which absorb light, and they tend to absorb light you know, toward the violet, while water tend to absorb light toward infrared. So the compromise is more or less in the middle around one micron. One nice experiment that I want to, to mention with red blood cell is one experiment. There are hundreds, so I do not have time, but uh, I just choose one. Uh, one, keeping a red blood cell, no? if you trap a red blood cell with one beam, it goes like this. Um, this is trapped with two beams and is investigated in the same time with Raman, which is important because with the two beams, you can also stretch the cell and you can observe the, oxygen, the correlation because the stretching and oxygenation. So, because basically what a red blood cell does, brings oxygen in the body, no? is essential, and how it delivers, stretching it, no? modifying the shape, Red blood cell is very flexible. So here we spoke about two beams, no? keeping the optical tweezers, uh, the cell. So how can we get multiple optical tweezers? Or by time sharing, that is, you move very fast the laser beam from a, play, from a trap to another so fast that the particle in the trap does not understand that the laser is not there. And you can do this with galvano mirrors or with acousto optic deflectors. Galvano mirrors are slower but are cheaper. Acousto are faster but are uh, more expensive. And you can get 2D arrays. With diffractive optical elements, you can get 3D arrays. And um, I think uh, Tatiana Alieva spoke to you about the nice uh, uh, optical currents uh, in 3D that can be created with one element. Then you can also combine more. So from our lab, uh, what we um, did was uh, a configuration like this, that we looked in a capillary, a red blood cell from two sides. One, we look with 100 pair, the objective that with a high numerical aperture objective to trap. And we passed this through a modulator to create multiple traps. And one, we image laterally. But since the objectives are big, you cannot fit two high numerical apertures together. So this is why one is 40, one is 100. And what you see here, this is a lateral view of a red blood cell, and this is the up view of the two traps and uh, how the red blood cell moves, is rotated. OK, can you follow? And here we have four traps and the red blood cell which sits and we want to see if we can detach it and we can tilt. And uh, also, you see, look here mainly. OK. Actually, we were interested here in, in the following application. In an application where we circulated in a capillary we circulated um, particles to be analyzed with X-ray. So it's kind of X-ray, let us say, crystallography, but at room temperature for microcrystals that you cannot grow to big sizes. So we tried first with starch, and uh, so we 
move the particles here and here we have the X-ray beam and the, here the detector and here you can observe the diffraction pattern for one shoot and here since the beam is focused, the X-ray beam is focused at sub-micron level, we can investigate in different points. Is what you see here. This is a grain of starch and we shoot here, 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 and these are the small patterns, patterns, and this is a bigger pattern. And then we made the proof of concept also with uh, insulin uh, microcrystal. Now, measuring piconewton forces with optical tweezers, direct and indirect measurements. So usually, indirect mar mar methods are applied where you measure the position and you assume that you have um, a harmonic potential characterizing the potential of the bead in the trap. But you measure the position. And to measure the position, you need to calibrate, so you need to measure the stiffness. Recently, it is much, it's much developed, this technique, direct technique, with single gradient beam. And uh, this is why I decided to, to speak about this first. So in this case, we detect the light momentum changes directly. So this uh, is basically for single beam trapping, is introduced by the group from Barcelona, Faré, Montes, uh, Usategui. Um, and uh, it starts from the idea that, okay, we should in principle measure backscattering and forward scattering to have a rigorous measurement. Now, as you see here, you see the scattering from a particle which is slightly moved from the optical trap. Okay? But most of the light is scattered forward. How much? Around 95%. So this would allow us, if we use still, you have to use a high numerical aperture because the angle is pi you know, to collect, which fulfills the Abbe sign condition because otherwise you cannot skip the position. You should be sure that what you measure is located where it should be. And where you measure in the back focal plane. And we will discuss shortly about this. So the Abbe condition allows you to know where, let us say, a ray or plane wave goes in the photodetector plane. If this rule is not uh, respected, then you have variations of the positions, okay? And this is uh, common for, so this is something re required for aplanatic uh, lenses or free, coma-free lenses. Then, the condition for the photodetector position in back focal plane, why? In back focal plane, so because you want that the intensity does not change the pattern there. For who does Fourier optics, it is a back focal plane, it is a Fourier plane. So you have in the back focal plane, you have the Fourier, the intensity of the Fourier transform at, of, of the light scattered. So this means that if I have an intensity pattern like this, it can move, but the shape should remain the same. Okay, which is a shift in variance of the Fourier transform. Okay, then you can use a detector like a position sensing detector, which is difference, differential de detector, no, which detects the differences for the light spot moving on the detector in one direction and then in two directions and connect this, of course, with the intensity and to the force. 
And what you get at the end is the force is proportional to the signal detected by your PSD and a constant, which means that you measure directly the force through the signal, not through position. So this method is independent of shape, size, refractive index. So it is strong. It's also insensitive to changes to the trap shape. Unfortunately, it requires a high numerical objective. So this means that we have to put one objective to trap and one to detect with very high numerical aperture. Very high numerical aperture means very low working distance. Where we put the sample? This is a question. So because if you work in biology, you have, uh, um, I mean, you, you need to put the cells, to put the water, to put the sample. OK. Uh, so for positions close to the equilibrium, there is a propor proportionality also with the position. In fact, historically, those who introduced a back focal plane, or not introduced fo back focal plane, interpreted what you get in the focal plane as from the interferometry point of view from the interference point of view. So Rites, Jitz, and Schmidt. Uh, so they gave a model and measured and said, OK, in the back focal plane, what you get is the interference between the light scattered by the particle. And the light, you have some light which is not intercepted by the particle. And the, with this, they built this model. So I put first the position, and they said, but this is valid also for momentum. Then there was another step forward, actually, but in the group of Bustamante, probably everyone knows Professor Bustamante, uh, where they did, developed a counter-propagating beam, optical tweezers, to measure forces for single molecule experiments. What was the point? The point was this, OK, if we do not want to use, we cannot use high numerical aperture lenses, what we can do? We use smaller apertures, but also smaller laser diameters. And then, well, not very small, but small enough. OK, so you have this is the size of the laser beam, but this is the aperture that you have at this position. And this is equilibrium, and this is shifted, and this gives you this. There is a small problem here. So this is a setup for measurements. There is a, pro a small problem. You have counter-propagating beams. So why? such a tweezer was used and not to a single beam because of the low numerical apertures. So if you can make experiments only with one side, it would be perfect because it allows you to work here. You have space. But like this, you have two cover slips very close to each other, a channel, and you insert the pipette, you fix one on one bead a tether, and then you have the molecule on another bead, and you move the chamber, and you make your measurements. In fact, here is illustrated one example. Okay? So you do not see the DNA filament because it's too thin, but you sense the force. So the bead, one bead is kept in the trap. Another one is on the pipette, and you move, you stretch the DNA, and you see the force versus the length. Then there are other configurations with a single beam, with, um, as I shown, with two beads, 
one fixed and one laser beam and two laser beams. I do not enter into detail. It's a very one of the good reviews is this by Moffitt, Bustamante, and so uh, that you can find. Now, if we speak about the indirect method, so the bead in the trap. So first of all, you need to measure the stiffness. The bead in the trap is uh, uh, has a potential, a harmonic potential, which means that the energy goes as a parabola, no? and uh, the force is proportional to the uh, displacement. This keeps laterally and vertically. No? This is describes the potential. And kappa bt is, uh, so kappa b is um, Boltzmann constant, and t is temperature. And there's a value. This is useful when you, for me at least, when I make calculations, kappa bt is around 4 piconewton per nanometer. No? When, uh, because if we use traditional units, then you get 10 to minus ta 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 ta. So what you can do here, you can track the particle. You have the x, y, zeta bidding trap. Then if you make the histogram of the position distributions, you get a Gaussian. If you consider the Boltzmann statistics, the probability density of the bid is this. And then from the Gaussian, you can get the potential. And from that, you get the stiffness of the trap calculating the variance, for instance. So fitting one of the two. So it's relatively simple, but you, you have to, to um, you have to consider that if you add Gaussian noise in your experiment, this Gaussian noise overlaps on these measurements, and this means that you underestimate the trap stiffness. Then the power spectrum analysis. I will skip this because a reason of time and because uh, Suleiman will uh, present you in the afternoon this better. So basically what you do, you make the Fourier transform and calculate of the traces, calculate the power, and from that you get the corner frequency, some param a parameter which allows you to, measure, to determine the stiffness. OK, now a kind of conclusion. So this is a paper, quite a relative paper, in which uh, this guy from Innsbruck, the, he measures axially the force with direct method. And um, so what we have here, we have the theoretical force along the size of the bead. The bead is uh, 3 micron, and here we have the units in micron, sorry. So it's blue. Then red is what is observable, because anyway, the aperture is smaller. Then if you reduce even more the aperture, black is 0.8. Red is 1.4. 0.8, oops, sorry. 0.8, you already have errors far away from the equilibrium. And this black line is the linear, no? which keeps only in this region. Okay. So then if we think again at the force expressed as Q and 1 P divided by C, we understand this. Okay. So as uh, a conclusion here, Typical values for optical tweezers go from 0.001 to 10 piconewton over nanometer. And these values are complementary for what you have with AFM, usually. So it is not that one is better than the other. They are complementary. You can study different phenomena. Now we go for applications of optical tweezers in living cells. And uh, what we can do, probing. So if we have a bead in a trap, 
and the cell which moves, we can measure the force exerted by the cell when it moves. So this is one example. If you have a bead and the cell which, because not all the cell move, so neutrophil moves very fast. Um, other cells do not move like uh, also neurons. They move, but not as fast. But you can probe them pushing on them, indentating them. And Suleiman will speak about this. Now, this is a third example, sorry. You can also put some molecules on the bead, attach the bead on the membrane, and pull to extract tethers to study additions of molecules to cell surface. So is a picture about quite a lot of experiments that you can do with a relatively simple tool. I give you one example from, from our lab, uh, work in collaboration with CISA, with Professor Torre. Uh, they are studying uh, neurons, very young neurons, uh, two days young neurons, uh, because those neurons develop. So they are, the connections are not between neurons are not established. So there are neurons which develop. And it is very important how they develop and how they create then synapses for all the future of the life of an individual or so. So here, what you see, you see at the terminal part of a neuron, of an axon like this, which is called growth cone, which is like my palm here, with fingers, which are called philopodia and lamellopodia. And the base of this is actin, structured in different ways. I show you the movement. I hope you see. So that is the philopodia. So it's, okay. The role of the gross cone is to investigate. To look what signals come from other neurons that we connect or not connect. Okay. And these are mechanical, biochemical signals. So what we did, we measured forces exerted by lamellopodia. And here you see the bead, the lamellopodia pushing, and the force exerted. And here you see a philopodia protrusion. It is a bundle of actin filaments. And by polymerization, it goes and pushes the bead. Um, so what we learned from this was that forces exerted by philopodia were below 3 piconewton and by lamellopodia below 20 piconewton. And uh, I tell you an anecdote about this value, 3 piconewton. We were very upset about this value that we obtained because we read papers for, for bundles of actin, synthetic bundles of actin, developing much bigger forces and an order, more than an order of magnitude. And we said, OK, we are wrong with the experiment. We do not measure correctly. And uh, observing better what happens, we saw that the forces are not continuous. So the philopodia is testing the bead. And moreover, is clever. Sometimes it's, we say that a neuron is clever, more smarter than a person. Because um, if an obstacle is reached, it does not push fully on it. But there is an, a reaction which limits the maximum force that can be developed. And this is sustained by, by the fact that uh, there is a high frequency of interception. Then we work with drugs uh, inhibiting actin, inhibiting myosin, and inhibiting microtubules. So that is the structure of um, the cell to see uh, what happens. And for instance, one interesting result was that inhibiting myosin and microtubules, philopodia continue to exert forces up to 3 piconewton because there you basically have actin only. There are quite a lot of papers after that about this. Cell membrane indentation by optical tweezers to measure cell elasticity. Why to measure? cell elasticity or stiffness because different cells have different mechanical properties. Because cancer cells change their mechanical properties during their cancer journey. And this is uh, of good sense. No? They live 
one organ, they have to enter the blood circuit, they then have to exit, and they have to establish in another place to create a secondary tumor. No? So a lot of changes happen there from a mechanical point of view. The idea is that elasticity stiffness might, might be a marker, a free, a bio-free label marker for diagnostics. Investigating cell mechanics helps to understand cell alteration. So it's not only diagnostics, but you understand mechanisms. So in general, it's accepted that cancer cells are softer than non-neoplastic cells. The question is, is it always true? Because otherwise, there are problems with diagnostics. No? So what we did, we did a comparison between uh, AFM experiments and optical tweezers experiments. Uh, about this optical part, the procedure Suleiman will explain to you. So we had and we have complementary values for forces, bigger forces for AM, low forces for optical tweezers, stiffness, and also the loading rate. So how fast you push on your sample. We studied three cell lines which are characterized by different um, neoplastic level. So HBL, normal, almost normal cells, no, no neoplastic. Low metastatic potential, high metastatic potential. I do not enter into detail of these things. But anyway, when you do the experiments, you should understand also if you damage the cell and where you should measure. Because as with our body, a cell does not have the same stiffness everywhere, above the nucleus, near the leading edge, and so on, so far. So here is just a picture of um, the AFM image and optical tweezers, uh, optical tweezers, optical microscopy, DAC image. And then we did experiments first with AFM and we measured from the nucleus toward the edge of the cell to understand how the young modulus goes. And it is decreasing. And um, then we confirm this also with optical tweezers. With optical tweezers, we are not able to measure so fast. So uh, to, we did three measurements, one above the cell, one intermediate, and one at the leading edge. The good news is that the two procedures, two techniques, gave similar results. In which terms? In terms of trend. That is, that for single isolated cells, both optical tweezers and FM indicated that the most aggressive is the softest. But if you observe here, the absolute values are three order of magnitudes difference. So AFM, kilopascal, optical tweezers, pascal. Okay. Why? Because the regimes of test techniques are different. So one conclusion here, important conclusion is when you say this is a stiffness of a cell, you should say you measured with AFM, with what you measured, you, um, where you measure, and so on. So in our opinion, a good, so in this paper we, in this paper we stated that um, measuring above the nucleus is the best. Then another point is if you, the cells are not isolated, are rare cases when they are isolated. They are connected with other cells. They, are, they sit on something. So how much the cell stiffness influences is influenced by cell-cell contact and cell-substrate contact? So in a recent paper, we uh, studied first cell-cell contact, and we had the surprise 
that MDAs of the most aggressive cells get stiffer when in contact, being similar to HBL and MCF. So you build uh, a building, forgetting all the conditions. So the idea is not always the most aggressive cells are the stiffer, uh, softer, softest. Okay. If I go too fast, please tell me. Here, then, one tries to understand from these mechanical properties which is the structure, which elements in the cell induce this property. We tried, so this is a confocal image of actin, one slice, and the nucleus for connected, uh, for connected and not connected cells. Frankly speaking, in our paper, we could not make an... Uh, so we could not find the conclusion for this. But in the same year, there, was, there is a group, in fact, they published in ACS Nano, we published lower impact, showing, here is the important information, showing that for the stiffer cells, green, now is microtubules, and actin is red, so you do not have red on the top of the fiber. So the, on the top of the fiber, on the top of the cell. So this means that you, if you have less actin, it is softer or less softer. So in principle, it is softer, no? OK, mechanotransduction. What means mechanotransduction? You apply a force. You stimulate mechanically the cells because the cells, they do not react only to biochemical signals. They react also to mechanical signals, things that they touch each other. They, uh, I, then it depends on what cells, what tissues, and so on. But definitely, there is an effect. Um, OK. So one of the experiments that we tried, we tried because we were inspired by the work of Michael Sheets, who is in Singapore, uh, as an institute of mechanobiology uh, there, um, was this. Let us coat the bead with uh, fibronectin, which uh, is characteristic to the extracellular matrix of the cell, and test what happens when we press with different strengths, strengths on the cell? What happens with the cell after? So the idea you have fibronectin, which connects to intra-membrane integrin, uh, a protein now, and then this binds to vinculin. And vinculin binds finally to actin. So the idea was. OK, here we exert a pressure. And we want to see through vinculin, which was um, transfected with G GFP, we see the reaction of the cell. And what we noticed, we noticed that so these are three beads. And on these three beads, we apply different power for trapping oh, the strengths. And uh, after 20 minutes, we observed that the intensity of the fluorescent signal indicating the accumulation of the vinculin is more or less proportional to the force applied. So the cell reacts at different forces, at the changes of the forces. Um, we sought at some more sophisticated uh, way to stress the cells. What you see here is a Hela cell going under the cage. So we built a cage of beads. Then we come with a cell, and then we, we stress the cell. Somehow, this is a too sophisticated configuration for what we could do in biology. We did it with diffractive optical elements and projecting of the modulator. And here, you see how it better how it works. So the cage is this. You have one bead on the top, 
the other level you have three, the other you have other three, and the cell comes here, and then go you go with the structure on, on top. Um, a nice example, uh, a recent example, which I like quite a lot, is um, mechano transduction to calcium signal, calcium signaling. So here, what it is about, it is force applied to a bead on the cell, and then study the calcium influx into the cell and the calcium release from the endoplasmatic reticulum of the cell. So calcium is essential in all the cells. In neurons, is is more than essential. So understanding how the calcium uh, regulates, for instance, the cytoskeleton rearrangement is very important. And um, here, what they used, they developed, they are, there is a group of 20 persons or so from different institutes. They are very strong in developing FRET probes, biosensors, um, with which you can follow the calcium, the binding of the calcium, so is a CAM modulin. I do not enter in too much detail to avoid that I bother you. So the idea for, so using the FRET is, I think Alberto already uh, explained to you, is, is that you, you have a biosensor and you use, uh, in which you have a donor and you have an acceptor and you excite only the donor and when you have an activation of the molecule, so it reconfigures and the donor and the acceptor get close each other, you have the emission from the acceptor, okay? For instance, here what you see, you see um, the activation of the calcium or the activity of the calcium when force it is applied with beads coated with different proteins. So it's fibronectin which interacts with the membrane's proteins and it is, um, I think is uh, BSA, bovine serum albumin, which does not interact. So in red here you see that when a force it is applied on such a bead, the cell answers. So the activity, calcium influx. While here, doesn't. I just want to show you. So the force was applied and the flesh that you saw was a calcium release, okay? Then you can build, they built wonderful experiments when they blocked, because why the calcium goes inside? Because you have ion channels. So ion channels, they are like mechanical valves. No? Something should come to open them. And usually that is, if it is mechani mechanical, it is tension of the membrane. The tension of the membrane is induced by force, by placing the bead and pulling. So it's... Okay. So we arrived at uh, biochemical stimulation induced by coated beads optically manipulated in contact to the cell or filled liposomes optically manipulated in the vicinity of the cell and photolyzed. And then the effect on the cell is observed by optical microscopy techniques in the same platform. Before I begin, I give you an example, not from our group, but a very beautiful example. Uh, by uh, Cress and uh, et al. Uh, what they did, they uh, fabricated uh, microbeads, polymer microbeads, biodegradable microbeads, in which they incorporated chemoattractant molecules and chemorepellent molecules in terms of the cell. Chemoattractant is to tell, come here, come here, repellent. And it's just example to show you what they did on neutrophil cells, 
Why? This was, in my opinion, very smart and they published very, very well. Because neutrophil cells are extremely motile. They move fast. By is their role, they should move because they should capture, they should uh, go around. So what you see here is a bead. This is a cell, and the bead is moved with optical tweezers. And this is real time. I mean, it's two minutes, three minutes experiment. And this is chemo-attractant. And this is, with two beads, chemo-repellent, the cell tries to go there, but there is a release of repellent molecules from, from the sources, saying, no, no, here you cannot come. Very nice. Fortunately for neurons, it's much more difficult to, to apply this and to control the rate of this. So what we are doing, as I said, is we are studying neurons, young neurons, and uh, the growth cones, and also how, so we try to mimic a neuron or the signal from another neuron to the neurons that we study. Here, instead, you have two neurons, which in two hours speak to each other. Okay, and you see that philopodia come, touch, tap, 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 tap. So they investigate each other. And you see, I don't say that these are synapses because it's not enough to shake the hands to make a business. It uh, should be something more. But the idea is that we take the second neuron aside and we want to study the effect of one molecule that is released by neurons on the other. So our goal actually is to create physiologically inspired experimental conditions, mimicking one of the two neurons. Because in biology, I think 98% of the experiments are done like this, you have the cells cultured, you want to change the chemical conditions, what you do, you pipette some microliter of, uh, and you soon have a constant no, distribution of molecules because of the diffusion. But in general, bi biology, and we all, we live because of gradients. Think of gradients of any type. Gradients, space gradients, um, time gradients, uh, chemical gradients. So gradients are fundamental, and they are fundamental also in biology. So one way to stimulate, so a bit better, is micropipet-based assay that I told you about. Another one, smart, is with cage molecules where you have, so you have the molecules, cage, and we switch them, we free them by light. And this is very popular, very useful in uh, neurobiology. Unfortunately, there are very few molecules that can be caged. Okay? So our approach is, uh, was introduced initially not for neurons by Sun and Chu, uh, and we applied to neurons, so we fill liposomes with the molecules, we wash then the solutions, and we take the liposomes, we put them in ambient, in, near the cells, we trap one liposome, we bring it close to, sorry, I have the explanation for this. So the, <laughs> I don't want to waste time. Um, for the functionalized beads, they are commercially available, very cheap, uh, functionalized with a carboxylic group, which allow you to attach any type of protein on them. Uh, field liposomes, they are like this. We put them inside. You see how it works. This is in contact. 
if you want to break, if you have liposomes, you have to break, you use an UV pulse laser to deliver the molecules. So one experiment, one first experiment was with BDNF, pre-derived neurotrophic factor. This is uh, probably you heard, have heard about neurotrophic growth factor. So they are important because they are a kind of nutrient, let us say, for, for, for cells, for neuronal cells. Uh, BDNF is uh, particularly important because it, it has a uh, role in the synapses, uh, long-term synapses. And um, so what we did, because it was a question, open question was this, um, can one bead coated with this protein stimulate, trigger the BDNF signal? And the answer was yes. Uh, and we studied this uh, first, that we trigger the receptor, and this means that uh, you see the phosphorylation. Uh, then uh, that uh, you have an, uh, the change of the calcium signal, and then that you have a translocation in the nucleus for the CFOS. I do not show you all of this. More information is in this uh, paper. I show you just the calcium. So how we do? This is a neuron. These are the dendrites. We first place a control, this is important, to place a control to see if you induce some effect, and we look at the calcium. And the calcium remains constant over 10 minutes. Then we add on another dendrite the stimulus, the BDNF bit, and we see that the calcium level increases, not only in the cell body, this is a cell body, but also in the dendrite. Then we make checks with two beads, BSA, to, to, to be sure that there is not a mechanical effect, but it is the chemical effect. OK, so the liposomes as vectors, also here there are quite a lot of uh, freedom degrees. We use this version, so because we put hydrophilic compound inside, Preparation is quite simple. So there are spherical vesicles from 50 nanometer to 50 micrometer, phospholipid bilayer membrane, aqueous core. This is also a configuration interesting to use with lipophilic compounds. So you insert the molecules in between the two layers of uh, lipids, but we use just this. One number that I think that it is important is that a liposome of one micrometer diameter filled with one nanomolar solution contains in average one molecule. So we like to work with one micrometer because we see them well. Concentration nanomolar you can get, so you can make experiments quite interesting. So. In this case, we create a gradient because we have the liposome here. Here is a point of, on the cell. And here it is represented how the concentration goes as a function of time and that function of distance from the source. Okay? So you see that in time, we have a saturation. So after a while, we get the same concentration. But in space, no? We have quite, not very sharp, but quite a concentration. So an example of this is uh, um, a project that we had with, uh, and we have still, with CISA, a group which uh, Professor Leniame, who is studying, um, is studying uh, PRPC. This is cellular prion protein, which is a a very important protein because it has a lot of functions which are not yet discovered. The version of an isomorph of uh, this is uh, Scarpi prion that we, you might have heard that this might be as the origin of a lot of uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases. 
but let us take the good guy, the PRPC. It is not well known how it works. And uh, it is everywhere. A bit like, I don't the know the name in English, but a bit like prezzemolo. Italians might, huh? Parcel. parcel. A bit like parcel. No? So PRPC in the cells is a bit like parcel in, uh, at least in Italian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, quite a, a same. Yeah, to say that it is everywhere, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what we uh, studied and we found was that uh, this molecule works like, uh, this protein like, works like a guidance molecule. So it, it guides the neurons, in the case of neurons, to grow. Also, it was interesting that we found that uh, they need, so they, uh, the PRPC without, sorry, the PRPC is also its receptor. So if we used mice knockout for PRPC, so without PRPC in the membrane, the effect disappeared, which means that you need to have the same molecule on the membrane to induce the effect. Then full length and so on and so far. Now here you will see the guidance. So here is the liposome, here is the growth cone of the neuron, and you will see the photolysis of the liposomes, and then the growth scone and the dendrite goes towards the source in 80 minutes or so. You see that it elongates, grows, and comes towards the source. Okay. So we ran the same game before with uh, guidance cues molecules because we were interested to see how many molecules are necessary to create an effect. And one important conclusion is that this, that only around five nitrogen molecules on a growth cone are enough to initiate attraction, but much more SEMA 3A, which is a repellent, molecules are necessary for repulsion. I do not run these movies, uh, maybe this, because this is the collapse so you see the photolysis, and then the collapse of the growth cone, because it's a semaphore in sending the signal. OK, this is the last one. So here we complicate it, because by now you saw only morphology effects from our group. I showed the calcium, which was um, calcium signal, but uh, not from our group, we had only morphological. So the idea in this project uh, was to study signal transduction, so chemical molecule, and then which element from the chain of the pathway of the signal is activated. And in these cases, we were interested about GTPases and uh, mainly about CDC42. So just to show you that this is a simplified diagram of the pathway of the signaling. So the point in biology is that you never, never have, OK, independent signal propagation. So, so these are the nodes of information membrane that this comes here, this comes here, this comes here. No, you very soon you have this, and this goes here, and this goes here, and it is, this is a complication because you have to separate you know, and to, to study some, some of them. So here what, in short, here what you have is 
uh, are figured the guidance cues and the receptors. So guidance cues come from outside. Here is a membrane. Here are the receptors. And then the pathway. And then you arrive to the effector and the F-actin polymerization, which makes the changes in the morphology. No? In this, important element is CDC42, which binds to PAC3 and triggers, so sends the signals to effector. Okay. So what we did was said, OK, we stimulate the cell locally, and then we look into the cell with FRET probes designed to let us know when CDC42 and PAC3 bind. So we work with two types of intermolecular and intramolecular probes. Intermolecular means that you have the donor attached on one molecule on CDC42, and you have the acceptor attached to another, and they are free, so floating around. And this is experimentally a problem because you do not have the um, stoichiometry one-to-one. -one. So you do not know how many of that and how many of the other you have when they bind, no? They bind, and then you have threat. So this other probe, intramolecular, you have both the donor and the acceptor on the same chain, and you look only at the configuration change. So this is more, is easier and uh, more rigorous experimental. The point is that Intramolecular biosensors are usually more, much more toxic. So you have to find a compromise, technical compromise, between rigorosity and between damaging, basically, the cell. So now we work with both. But at the beginning, we, we tried first with intramolecular, and we went back to intermolecular. OK, the setup is something like this. It is an optical microscope inverted where we have optical tweezers. We have um, the laser to break the liposomes, 355 pulse laser. We have the fluorescence source. And then we have uh, an auto split with, with which we, we uh, project on our camera. We project um, the fluorescence from the donor and from the acceptor, because this is fundamental for interpreting threat. OK, this is the neuroblastoma, the gross cone. We place a bit here. After three second, 30 seconds, the trap is switched off. The bead goes on. And we follow for 15 minutes. And we see the retraction of the cell. Oops, sorry. You see that it retracted from white to red. And uh, this is the activity of CDC42, spontaneous, so without any stimulation. And the in high intensity reflects higher activity. And this is much more moved. It is stimulated. So I would skip this because I am already out of time. And, um, and it is also some of details now about the correlations. I just mentioned that very interesting experiments can be done even with much simpler things. Instead of using beads, you use biological particles. We run quite interesting experiments with extracellular vesicles, which are vesicles released by uh, cells diseased. So they send information to other cells. Also this, conclusions. So we can measure forces. We can apply forces. We can handle vectors carrying activity molecules to stimulate local cells. And uh, we have the advantage that everything is um, 
compatible with optical microscopy, with imaging, which means that we can see what we manipulate and manipulate what we see. So here, thanks to many people who collaborated and, uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I think we